So in the normal situations, fluid balance is fairly easy to maintain. When we're thirsty, well, when our fluid levels are low, we feel thirsty, so we drink. So thirst is, is something that increases fluid levels because we drink. Actually, fluid levels have to drop a fair bit before we start feeling thirsty, so um, it's often good to drink before we feel thirsty, but nevertheless, thirst will control uh, the amount of water in the body by increasing it. And of course, the other main thing that controls the amount of water in the body, as we've discussed, is the concentration of the urine. When we want to conserve water, the urine will be more concentrated and will pass smaller volumes. When we want to get, get rid of, when we want to excrete more water, the urine will be more dilute and we'll have larger urine volumes. And there's one interesting thing here just before we're going to look at the abnormal situation, and that is the concept of the obligatory urine volume. Now, we've got so much waste to excrete per day. Waste products of metabolism, urea, for example, need to be excreted. And the smallest volume of urine that that can be facilitated via, the smallest vehicle of water that can excrete the amount of waste product we produce in a day, is 400 mils. So if someone's producing four or 500 mils of urine per day, very concentrated urine, that's probably enough to get rid of all the waste products that they're generating less than 400 mils a day and they're not excreting all of the waste products and they're probably accumulating them and they will become toxic. But now let's go and look at the abnormal situation. <clears throat> we're going to look at abnormal or abnormalities of fluid and electrolyte balance. But first of all we're going to look at the water fluid balance first of all. And we'll start off by looking at what happens if there's too much water in the body. Now, this can happen uh, if we drink too much. We'd have to drink an awful lot too much, but some people drink and drink and drink lots and lots. This happens in, in mental illnesses such as schizophrenia, for example, where the patient just drinks huge amounts of water. There's a name for it. It's called polydipsia. And the patient gets uh, too much water in the system and water intoxication. The brain doesn't quite work properly. And um, because there's too much water in the blood, it means the osmotic pressure of the blood will be lower, um, so water will tend to diffuse into the red cells. So the red cells tend to get blown up. But as well as that, when there's too much fluid in the body, it dilutes the electrolytes. So effectively, the amount of electrolytes, the percentage of electrolytes in the blood, will also drop, giving rise to problems associated with electrolyte imbalance, which we'll look at later on. So too much water just from drinking is a possibility, but fairly uncommon. Most of us don't need to worry about that. If we drink plenty of water, it's actually quite a good idea. Water intoxication is really a pathological uh, condition. But one time where we may come across fluid overload is when we're giving intravenous fluids. This is called iatrogenic fluid overload. Iatrogenic means any condition caused by medical treatment. So iatros is the Greek word for doctor. Genic means to begin. So an iatrogenic disorder is one which literally begins with the doctor. But we normally use this term to mean any condition caused by medical treatment. So if we give too many intravenous fluids, the patient will become fluid overloaded. Now, if you accidentally run a litre of saline through into the veins of an adult, probably they'll get away with that. So that there won't be any major problem unless they've got some condition like severe congestive cardiac failure or renal failure. But normally that wouldn't cause too much problems. But with children, it does. This is a serious risk with children. If a litre of fluid accidentally runs into the vein of a child, especially a small child, it will kill them. So when you're infusing fluids into children, you must be very careful to maintain the prescribed rate. That's true for all management of all intravenous fluids, of course. You must be very careful to maintain the rate. But with children, it's absolutely critical. So we'd normally use some sort of volumetric device, a pump of some sort, to control the rate at which the fluid is administered. Failing that, we would run the fluid from the infusion bag into a burette or some other device which would allow us to measure and control the amount of fluid which goes in. Because accidental fluid overload can be fatal in, in children. But it's bad for anyone, of course. What happens is you get an acute congestive cardiac failure in fluid overload. The left ventricle will be unable to pump out all the fluid that is returning to it. 
This will result in an increase in pressure in the uh, blood in the left atria, damming back into the pulmonary veins, damming back into the pulmonary capillaries. So there'll be an increased blood pressure in the pulmonary capillaries. This will mean that fluid from the lungs is not reabsorbed back into the circulatory system. The effect of that will be pulmonary edema. So probably the first thing you'll notice in fluid overload is the patient will complain of shortness of breath because of pulmonary edema. This will get worse if you lie the patient down. So if this happens, you must stop the intravenous infusion straight away. You must sit the patient upright in bed so that the water is able to drain down off their lung fields down to the bottom to leave some lung fields nearer the top for them to breathe through. And you probably want the doctors to prescribe some diuretics as well to get rid of the excess fluid. In time, systemic edema in the ankles and in the sacrum would also develop. But beware of fluid overload and monitor that by making sure that the patient is breathing easily and especially breathing easily when, when they're lying down. Let's just look at that on some notes now. So too much water and excess of water in the system can be caused by too much drinking or overzealous administration of intravenous fluids. As we said, the fluid overload can contribute towards an acute congestive cardiac failure. And the first thing we would see there is the pulmonary edema. The patient would be short of breath. It would also be very apparent on chest x-ray. There may also be overhydration of cells because the osmotic pressure in the cell would be higher than the osmotic pressure in the plasma. And there is also a reduced concentration of electrolytes. So prevent psychiatric patients from drinking too much. Prevent them from drinking too much. And this one, monitor the amount of fluid that's been given to patients. Of course, if you're able to monitor central venous pressure, then fluid overload should not occur. But if it does, well, firstly, prevent it occurring, and if it does, treat it promptly by sitting the patient up, stopping the infusion, and giving diuretics. So, in that case, we're really considering fluid overload in patients that are otherwise normal. Let's now consider some disease states which can lead to fluid overload. And the first one I want to think about is, is heart failure, congestive heart failure. That will result in a backlog of the venous blood and an increase in the amount of fluids in the body. So heart failure will lead to fluid retention. That's why diuretics are often prescribed for patients with heart failure. Now another possible cause of fluid retention in the body is hypoalbuminemia. Hypo low albumin is the protein in the blood. So in other words a hypoproteinemia. Now, if there's a hypoproteinemia or a hypoalbuminemia, low amount of albumin in the blood, now, let me ask you, what will that do to osmotic pressure? If the amount of protein in the blood is low, what will that do to the osmotic pressure of the blood? Well, what that will do is lower the osmotic pressure of the blood. Now, if you lower the osmotic pressure of the blood, what will that do to the amount of tissue fluid which is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary? Well, if the osmotic pressure of the blood is lowered, that will reduce the amount of fluid which is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary. If less, food is if less fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary, what will that do to the amount of fluid left in the tissue spaces? Well, if less fluid is reabsorbed, then more fluid will be left in the tissue spaces. In other words, you'll get an accumulation of fluid what do we call an accumulation of fluid in the tissue spaces? Well, if we get a, flu a fluid accumulation in the tissue spaces, we refer to that as edema. So, for example, if children are malnourished and they have a hypoproteinemia, they'll become edematous. Fluid will collect in their ankles, and fluid will collect in the abdomen as well because of the mesentery and the peritoneal, uh, the, um, the peritoneal cavity. 
fluid will collect in it and they get blown up tummies. The boys sometimes get swollen um, scrotums because of the fluid. Hypoproteinemia leads to fluid retention. Now, of course, it's the kidneys that excrete the amount of, uh, that excrete water from the body. So if there's a renal failure for whatever reason, if the kidneys aren't working properly, then that can also lead to an accumulation of water. One of the main reasons that leads to an accumulation of water, actually, is if the kidneys are unable to excrete saline, the sodium, because the sodium is very osmotic and it attracts water into the circulatory system. So really, any condition which causes a retention of sodium will also cause a retention of um, water. And the final disease state I want to mention is uh, hepatic disease, particularly hepatic cirrhosis. If there's uh, inflammation and uh, fibrosis in the liver, we call that uh, cirrhosis, hepatic cirrhosis. And that can cause ascites, the swelling of the uh, abdomen. And as well as that, it's the liver that makes plasma proteins. So if the liver's not working properly, there can be lower amounts of plasma protein causing edema via the mechanisms that we've mentioned. So bearing these things in mind, let's think now what the clinical features um, of fluid retention are. Well, the first one is fairly obvious, we've mentioned, is edema. Now, um, the first place that edema is often evident is, is in the ankles of the patient standing up because it falls by gravity. Or if they're lying in bed, it's probably the sacrum that you'll uh, notice it in first. And of course, there can also be pulmonary edema, and we know about that because of shortness of breath, especially when lying down. So systemic edema and pulmonary edema, both signs of too much water in the body. There can also be pleural effusions where water is lost into the potential pleural space and even pericardial effusions can also occur. Fluid in round about uh, the peri the, it, within the pericardial sac. That's quite a problem because that can embarrass the function of the heart. That's called, it's like a tamponade effect on the heart. So both potentially fairly serious conditions. Another symptom of fluid overload is accumulation of fluid in the abdomen. That's called ascites. And you look at the jugular veins on the patient's neck, you'll see that they are congested, giving rise to a raised jugular venous pressure. Disease states causing fluid retention. Clinical features of fluid retention. So just to conclude this part of the talk on fluid overload or too much water, let's mention the treatments. I think it should be fairly obvious now that the treatment is going to depend on the cause. If it's a psychiatric cause and the patient's drinking too much water, then physically stop them drinking too much water or restrict the amount of water they have or treat the underlying psychiatric condition, probably with um, phenothiazine drugs such as chlorpromazine. Um, might be necessary if the cause is schizophrenia. If the cause is heart failure, treat whatever's causing the heart failure. It could be a valve problem that needs uh, surgery. Or it could be congestive cardiac failure that requires digoxin, for example. If the cause is hypoalbuminemia or hypoproteinemia, then increase the, protein in the, uh, the amount of protein in the blood. If this is caused by malnutrition, then restoration of a normal diet should completely reverse the edema as the protein starts to increase the amount of protein in the blood, as the amount of protein in the diet increases the amount of protein in the blood. If it's renal impairment, see if you can treat the underlying cause of the renal impairment. If not, the patient may need some form of dialysis. Um, it could be, though, uh, that, that uh, the patient needs diuretics. Diuretics are drugs which reduce 
the amount of water in the body by increasing the diuresis, by increasing the amount of water that's excreted. So diuretics would be the usual symptomatic treatment for these conditions. Diuretics are normally very effective and large volumes of urine are produced, providing renal function is, is normal. And perhaps in some patients, uh, some cases, it's worth reducing the amount of sodium in the diet. This doesn't really affect everyone, but some people do seem particularly sensitive to sodium. So it's worth reducing the amount of sodium in the diet, and that may have some beneficial effect on the increased amount of water present in the body. Now we've looked at what happens if there's too much water. The next part of this talk will go on and look at what happens if there is not enough water in the body.